Hello and welcome to worship this second week of Advent on the 6th of December. This week we look at a reading from the book of the prophet Joel and think about how the presence of God is there even in disasters and plagues. Joel talks of a plague of locusts. In our godly play reading, we hear about the Holy Family and consider this week a week of the Advent candle for peace. And we hear from Sally Foster Fulton, who is the head of Christian Aid in Scotland, and hear about the real work they're doing in an area knowing a plague of locusts today in East Africa and especially Ethiopia. But before all this, we come, we come in worship. So let's say together our Advent Litany. Among the poor, among the proud, among the persecuted, among the privileged, Christ is coming. He is coming to make all things new. In the private house, in the marketplace, in the wedding feast, in the judgment hall, Christ is coming. He is coming to make all things new. With a gentle touch, with an angry word, with a clear conscience, with a burning love, Christ is coming. He is coming to make all things new. That the kingdom might come. That the world might believe. That the powerful might stumble. That the humble might be raised. Christ is coming. He is coming to make all things new. Within us without us, among us, before us, in this place, in every place, for this time, for all time, Christ is coming. He's coming to make all things new. This, this, is the godly play story for Advent, the second week. Advent is a time of getting ready. Blue is the colour of getting ready. It's the colour of the sky just before dawn when the sun comes up and a new day comes. This is the card of the prophets. Prophets are people who come so close to God and God comes so close to them that they know exactly what to do. Prophets point the way for people to follow God's way. The prophets knew something special was going to happen. And they said it would happen at Bethlehem. Bethlehem is the place we travel to in Advent. Us with the following the way of the prophets with Mary and Joseph and the shepherds and the magi and the angels and everyone else. Because a king was coming. And the king that was coming is coming still. That's a mystery. And mysteries can be difficult. It's easy to go straight through the middle of a mystery and not even notice. Which is why we have the time of Advent to get ready for the mystery of Christmas. 
something incredible is going to happen at Bethlehem. This is a card for the second week of Advent. Do you see Bethlehem? It's the card of the Holy Family. This is Mary. And this is Joseph. They were on their way to Bethlehem. And Mary was about to have a baby. Walking on the long road is very difficult when you're about to have a baby. This is the donkey. When Mary couldn't walk anymore, she would ride on the donkey. But when you're about to have a baby, riding on a donkey isn't very easy. And so when she couldn't ride anymore, she would walk again. She rode and she walked. She rode and she walked. It must have been very slow going. They must have been the last people coming up the road to Bethlehem that night. This is the light of the prophets. This is the light of the Holy Family. Let's enjoy the light. Do you see how the light is just in one place, the light of the prophets? And the light of the Holy Family is just in one place. We're going to do something very special. We're going to change the light. Watch. See how the light that is in one place gathers and spreads through the room. Do you see it? Spreading through the room, the light of the prophets. Spreading through the room. The light of the Holy Family. The light has changed. And now wherever we go this Advent week, we can be close to the light of the prophets and the light of the Holy Family. This is the way to get ready for the mystery of Christmas. Let's come close to the light. Thank you.
reading today comes from the book of the prophet Joel at chapter 2 and verses 12 through to 29. Let's listen for the word of God. Yet even now, says the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping and with mourning. Rend your hearts and not your clothing. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love, and relents from punishing. Who knows whether he will turn and relent, and leave a blessing behind him, a grain offering and a drink offering for the Lord your God? Blow the trumpet in Zion, sanctify a fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the people. Sanctify the congregation, assemble the aged, gather the children, even infants at the breast. Let the bridegroom leave his room and the bride her canopy. Between the vestibule and the altar, let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, weep. Let them say, spare your people, O Lord, and do not make your heritage a mockery, a byword among the nations. Why should it be said among the peoples, where is their God? Then the Lord became jealous for his land and had pity on his people. In response to his people, the Lord said, I am sending you grain, wine and oil, and you will be satisfied. And I will no more make you a mockery amongst the nations. I will remove the northern army far from you and drive it into a parched and desolate land, its front into the eastern sea, and its rear into the western sea. Its stench and foul smell will rise up. Surely he has done great things. Do not fear, O soil. Be glad and rejoice, for the Lord has done great things. Do not fear, you animals of the field, for the pastures of the wilderness are green. The tree bears its fruit, the fig tree and the vine give their full yield. O children of Zion, be glad, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he has given the early rain for your vindication. He has poured down for you abundant rain, the altar and the, the early and the later rain, as before. The threshing floors shall be full of grain. The vats shall overflow with wine and oil. I will repay you for the years that the swarming locust has eaten. The hopper, the destroyer and the cutter, my great army which I sent against you. You shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God who has dealt wondrously with you. And my people shall never again be put to shame. You shall know that I am in the midst of Israel, and that I, the Lord, am your God, and there is no other. And my people shall never again be put to shame. Then, afterward, I will pour out my Spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams and your young men shall see visions. Even on the male and female servants in those days, I will pour out my spirit. Amen. Last week, we spoke about how we're going to be taking our lead in readings from the system called the Narrative Lectionary, a system that allows us to spend more time with some of the too often overlooked figures in the Bible. 
This week we have Joel, the prophet, who, like the others, we sometimes call minor prophets in what the Hebrew Bible calls the Book of the Twelve. But the minor prophets are minor, can be called minor only in terms of their length. The saying that good things come in small packages holds true of them. And the prophetic books, these 12 small prophetic books, each hold a powerful punch. They throw up really important questions. So for Joel, well, he's writing in a pretty dire context. He is being called to prophesy at a time when his people are experiencing an extraordinary affliction through a devastating plague of locusts that has taken everything from them. In his prophetic imagery, these locusts have become an army from the north, pillaging and stripping bare, that language that we heard in the reading. And the job of a prophet in that context is to interpret the signs of the times, to make sense of what God is saying in and through the situation and to communicate that to God's people. The idea of a plague, whether of locusts or more generally, is today much sharper and more immediate than we might have heard it a year ago. Is Covid a plague of sorts? Plagues are, we know, afflictions which appear as if out of the blue, affecting society top to bottom. We also mustn't forget that today locusts are far from a thing of the past. Climate change means that natural calamities across the world of all types are becoming more common. As we speak, a plague of locusts is devastating communities in Ethiopia right now, reaping destruction of exactly the kind that we heard Joel talk about. In this, our online worship, I'm going to include a video with an interview from the head of Christian Aid in Scotland, the Reverend Sally Foster Fulton, talking about what Christian Aid are doing and what we can do to help those affected by the plague of locusts in Ethiopia. Now, the thing about plagues and the question that we might be tempted to ask if we were in Joel's position is trying to work out where has a plague come from? What's caused it? We perhaps subconsciously tend to think of plagues being directed somehow towards people who deserve it, based on the story of God sending the plagues to the Egyptians when the Pharaoh wouldn't let the Israelite slaves free. Now, if we go down that route, we break off into a number of questions that begin asking, well, what's a good, good God doing sending plagues in the first place, causing suffering? But I don't think that's always a helpful route of questions. Because interesting philosophically, though it may be, asking that question is rarely a comfort for folk actually suffering. Because if you start hypothesising if, if, and it's a big if God is the origin of a plague, then you're left saying, well, what are we to do about it? What's the appropriate response? Of course, biblically, the appropriate response is to turn to God in humility and repentance. Repentance which involves being turned around in heart and soul back towards a God who is looking to receive us. But then aren't we to serve God in humility and repentance always? And if God isn't the origin of the plague, well, then the biblical response would be to seek God's strength and to seek God's comfort throughout our suffering. 
In either case, we should be doing that anyway. So is a better question not less about the origin of a plague and suffering and more about the prophetic question, which is, where is God in this? Because that's a question that brings a better answer with more comfort for those actually suffering. Because God is, always is, with those who are suffering. God is always with those who suffer. There is only one who has ever known what it is to suffer without God's presence. And that suffering took place on a cross at Calvary. And as a mystery that we claim at the heart of our faith, precisely in that once and for all saving action, Jesus won for all those who suffer, God's closest presence and richest blessing. Christ is a fulfilment of his own promise on the Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And so if we return to Joel for a moment, we hear the way that God answered Joel and how Joel's people called for God's mercy. We hear God say how God is determined to drive away the northern army of the locusts and restore the people their wine and grain and oil and pasture and rainwater. But there's more than that. God promises God's own presence amongst the Israelites. And that God will pour out the divine spirit on God's people. So that the sons and daughters will prophesy. The old will see visions. The young will dream dreams. And with those words, we're now back squarely in the theme of Advent. For if Advent is anything, it is a call to be the ones who take part in Joel's prophetic work of knowing and preparing the way of the Lord. If Advent is anything, it is a time to see visions and dream dreams and dare to believe anew in the miracle of love come as human flesh. And what ought we to do? What ought we to seek with this prophetic zeal? What ought to occupy our visions and fill our dreams? Well, we lit our second Advent candle for peace. We know that Christ gave the disciples peace. We know what Christ said about peacemakers in that Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called children of God. Now there are sermons and sermons on the nature of peace and what it means to be a peacemaker. Whenever we study the Gospels, we're looking at Jesus, the one who comes in peace, the one who gives peace. There are observations to be made about peace being not simply an absence of violence, but an all-encompassing, whole-person shalom. But this week, let us take peace as it comes to us and commit ourselves to be peacemakers, worthy of being called children of God. This Advent time, let us acknowledge God's presence in the suffering and plague. Let us be ones who give comfort to the afflicted. And let us be the ones who begin to be peacemakers in a troubled world. Amen. Sally, great to be with you. Uh, you are presently serving as the head of Christian Aid Scotland. Christian Aid is focusing on some work in Ethiopia yeah. right now. Tell us about the situation in Ethiopia. Okay. 
situation in Ethiopia, again, goes back to one of the key things is climate change. Um, drought after flood, after drought, after food insecurity, the latest on top of this um, being COVID and also locusts. Um, and biblical proportions is not an, underestimate, an, an underestimation. Um, our head of humanitarian has said that if COVID hadn't come along and taken the world's imagination, that the locust infestation in the east of Africa would be all over, be all over the news. It is horrible. A one swarm in one day can eat as much food as 35,000 people. Sally, I follow the news. Mm -hmm. I read extensively online. I have not even heard of this locust infestation. Mm -hmm. Is it possible to give us a, a sense of the scale of this and mm -hmm. the impact on the ground for ordinary folk? The, the scale is massive. And what has happened is, again, climate change makes it um, almost a perfect storm. So you had long long-standing drought in Ethiopia and in the east of Africa. Um, and then you had massive cyclones and heavy, heavy rains are just pouring down. That's the perfect breeding ground for locusts. And the desert locust is, is the most aggressive. Um, so we're talking about millions of, of locusts that then move across and they eat everything. And as I said, they can eat enough food in one day um, for 35,000 people. And so that has been sweeping across Ethiopia um, and across um, the East, East Africa. So it's been huge. Add that to already folk were struggling because of the drought, so they're just recovering from those. Um, and then you have the locusts coming and eating what's left, um, leaving people incredibly food insecure. And then you've got COVID on top of that, which complicates getting humanitarian aid to people. It complicates with travel. It rips away any kind of export mm -hmm. that, that these countries have that fragile you know, bringing in of, of income. So it's been devastating. Let me just clarify. You said there, I think, mm. that the locusts will devour the food of how many thousands of people in one day? 35,000. 35,000 folk. We're at the beginning of Advent. Mm. And Advent is traditionally that season in which we look forward to mm. what is coming. We anticipate, we long for that which will be revealed. Now, it seems to me that we long for the kingdom, mm. uh, thy kingdom come. Are we waiting in vain? Mm. Are we waiting in vain, Sally, or is there a different quality to this Christian longing and hoping that somehow underpins it with, if not certainties, then mm. hopefulness? One of the things that lights my fire at Advent is it isn't just this longing and waiting and longing, it's expecting. We expect right. that things will change, that the poor will be fed. You know, when, when Jesus talks about, you know, this is what my kingdom looks like, you know, and it's, you know, blessed will be the poor. The poor will be blessed. The cue shifts. All of a sudden, people's priorities change. And those folk who have been pushed to the edges are brought to the center or given their space back in the center. So for me, Advent is not just about that, that longing and waiting, but that expecting that pushes you, that drives you forward to do things. There's an Advent hymn, you put it in my mind, Come Thou Long Expected Jesus. What would that look like this year? Advent 2020, what would Jesus coming into the world look like? Hmm. For me, it would look like this. It would flip everything on its head. Um, you know, that, that's, from, yeah, I think it would, it, what it would look like is instead of saying, I've got a little bit left over, I'll give that. It's look at, what, look at all that we have. This belongs to all of us. Now, how do we share it equally? Um, you know, switching around and not thinking about, you know, as, you, as we were talking a little while ago, you know, the locusts come in and just, they are sweeping across places and, and leaving nothing in their wake. Mm -hmm. Consumerism and capitalism and our obsession with stuff looks a bit like that sometimes for the world. A locust just sweeping in and taking everything. So actually, it would look to me like a huge rebalance. Yeah. You very much touched on something for me there because... 
years ago when my children were wee, mm. uh, maybe again we're of a similar vintage, Teletubbies. Oh my goodness, Paul. Well, my, bo Paul, my <laughs> boys, uh, my oldest boy wanted a Teletubby toy for Christmas. I was in every shop, the shelves were bare. Mm. And the image actually in my mind was that the locusts have come and just <laughs> devoured and swept clean those shelves. But what a different thing we're talking about mm. by way of scooping up stuff as opposed mm. to what's going on in Ethiopia. This has been a tough year mm. for virtually everybody the, the, over the whole earth. We're looking for some joy, mm. and, and not least as we move towards Christmas. Where is their joy? Even as we talk about Ethiopia and the locust, as you've described, is it hopeless? Is it despair? Or somewhere is there joy in the mix? There's always joy in the mix. And I think it's one of the most extraordinary things to, to see people with nothing still reaching out to each other, still finding joy in each other, still being willing to share with each other in the most, in the most difficult times. Um, I think joy is irrepressible. Mm. Um, so is there joy? Yes. But I think we, in the midst of that joy, um, realizing how hard things are for people and, and acknowledging that, you know, it has been a really difficult year. Um, you know, if we look at, you know, as, as we sit here, not quite at Christmas. We don't know what that's going to look like for, for folk across the UK and here in Scotland. Will we be able to be with our families or will we not? Um, you know, it, it's going to be bittersweet no matter what happens. But to be able to share with people um, gives joy. You'll know well some of the passages that are often read at this time of year within church worship and so on. Not least some of the Old Testament material in Isaiah. Uh, where we're told the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light uh, and we have a messianic mm. picture. Is there anything in that Old Testament material mm. or even in the, the narratives that we read mm -hmm. leading to the birth of Christ, is there something in that that speaks particularly to you? Mm. When you? When you quoted that, the people who've walked in darkness have seen a great light, it's... I think sometimes it's really freeing to say, okay, what light do I need to see? Who do I need to be listening to? Who's going to, who can teach me? Who can teach me? Mm -hmm. um, and for us to listen to our friends in places like Ethiopia, um, who have so much to teach us um, about life and love and working together. So, you know, we all can be light to each other. Let me finish up with this. Here we are at the beginning of Advent. Uh, we have these weeks ahead of us, preparation, one might say. Um, how are you going to use Advent this year, Sally, by way of readying yourself mm -hmm. uh, for welcoming Christ into his world once more? Mm. Every year I try to take that, claim that space back and really do that, sit back and wait. We don't wait well. So actually looking at, at this, this space that we've been given, we've been asked to, to wait and to watch and to expect. So what can we be doing differently as we wait and watch and expect? Sally, the Church of Scotland and Christian Aid have long been uh, okay. partners together. Let me wish you well in your work uh, and Christian Aid as an organisation as it continues to be at the very forefront uh, of challenging us uh, to make real the gospel news. Good to talk, Sally. Lovely to talk to you. Every blessing Thank to you. you. And you. Let's pray. God of peace, we know how your people suffer, and we pray for all those suffering and afflicted this day. We also pray with words given to us from those working for Christian aid in Ethiopia right now. So we pray for the work that Christian aid is doing to address the climate crisis causing drought and food insecurity, to support 
Christian aid as they provide for internally displaced people. And we pray for the eradication of disease outbreaks and desert locusts so that Ethiopian communities can live decent lives. We pray for Ethiopia so that peaceful coexistence will prevail and that people displaced will get back to normal life. We pray for the work that Christian Aid is doing to fight the COVID-19 pandemic and the communities that they are serving, so that families who know about the disease will be resilient to its impacts. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Amen. Now let us go to take our worship from this time into the rest of our week. And let us go with this Advent blessing. God of the watching ones, the waiting ones, the slow and suffering ones. God of the angels in heaven and the child in the womb. Give us your benediction, your good word for our souls, that we might rest and rise in the kindness of your company. Amen. <laughs>